And uh, Pam Bro, I've known her for years. We, we go back to the 80s. And Pam's just got the warmest heart. Just her, her heart is just glowing. Uh, academically, she has her, her doctorate in uh, divinity. Uh, and uh, we're just so glad to have you today, Pam. So come on up. Well, that certainly was festive, and it's so wonderful to be here with all of you during this time uh, of holiness and joy all coming together as one. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer and our beloved. Amen. Her name was Serafa. She was the innkeeper's daughter. His name was Apsifar. She was, according to Mr. Casey, about 13 years old, a year or so younger than the mother to be of, of Jesus very soon. And yet, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I wanted to share a little bit about something before we get into her amazing story that came through. Mr. Casey. So the name of the sermon is Reimagining the Christmas Story Through the Eyes of the Innkeeper's Daughter, Tarafa. Now, when I was a child, I was the oldest of four children, I guess all under uh, six, seven, and I, every Christmas, I would look at the crest scene that was up at the front of the church. You all know what that is, right? Uh, and of course, the Advent wreath is uh, what is traditionally done as well. But many of us have a crest in our home or in our place of worship. And I would look at it, and I would see there's the shepherds, and they're male, and there's the wise men. And they're male. There's Joseph. Of course, he's male. And there's a shepherd boy. He's male. And uh, then I'd see Mary there, because Jesus, of course, was male there. And I looked, I would look every time as a young child, six years old, and wonder, where are the women? Did the women do nothing at all for the whole 2,000 years of the Christian church growth? Uh, did men do it all? Uh, and I was always puzzled by that. So that's why it's been one of my lifelong callings, this life, to lift up the stories of women and girls uh, to, um, to help bring the reemergence back of the divine feminine uh, so we go back more into a balance. And several psychics have assured me that I've been a male many times these last few lifetimes. So I said, what? I'm dismantling what I built? Oh, great. Uh, that, that's what happens as we learn, as we grow in consciousness and in love. Now, today, has a special meaning for me, a special event, uh, because as I just mentioned, I grew up the oldest of four girls. I had, gave birth to two baby girls, two, two girls. And now, this past October, both of my daughters were pregnant and delivered in October two little grandbaby boys <laughs> to us, to our family. Uh, one's named Finnegan, and the other is Theo. And I'm going to have to get used to whatever that means to raise a boy, because I'm so familiar with girl energy and girl things. 
But I, as I held Finnegan, they finally let him out of the hospital because of COVID. We couldn't see him till the second day of his life. But the baby's still pretty brand new, smells like angels when you hold him. And so I'm holding Finnegan and talking to him, communing with him and his soul. And, and it came to me, I, as I'm watching, I say, oh my gosh, what a hard thing to get reincarnated. What a hard thing to take our huge soul for Jesus, to take the whole universe and pack it in such a little package. And so here's this tiny baby, and you know that human beings are the most vulnerable uh, in the whole animal world. Uh, they're the most vulnerable as infants. They can do nothing for themselves to survive. So anyway, I'm looking at this baby, brand new, brand new. And I, I also thought, not only does it take courage to come and incarnate to be here, for Jesus to have the calling that he did, but also, I mean, the little infant can't tell that these big fists that he sticks in his mouth are connected to his arms. He doesn't know that yet. And he can't see much farther than 12 inches away until his vision develops outside of the womb. So it's really to be a fascinating thing to, to hold an infant and watch an infant, a little boy infant, makes me feel closer to Jesus and to Mary, being a mother and a grandmother that I am. Now, I want to give you just a little background, and it's going to be very little because there's so much available at the Airy Bookstore, or especially in the readings, which is where I got this reading impacted me so much that I copied the paper is probably 50 years old to copy the actual readings. But this book I recommend called uh, The Christmas Story as Told by Edgar Cayce uh, came out in uh, 96. And uh, people did it as a love offering to have a version children could relate to. So it gives the background of the Essenes and of Mary being chosen to be the mother of Jesus. I love the translation of the word is seen, which means expectant ones. They, this community, have been working for 500 years to perfect a woman in her soul, in her training, in her physicality, in her emotions, to be worthy to bring, be the mother of the Christ child when he came as the Messiah for the Jews and ultimately for the whole world. Now, the only thing I'm going to say about Mary, and she is the dominant one of the woman, she's the only woman in the whole crash story. Um, I'm so glad you read that section, though, David, because it says Mary pondered these things at her heart. So there's more about Mary, the virgin, the mother of Jesus in the Quran than there is in the Christian Gospels. As a scholar, I'm sharing that with you. Uh, so the only thing I'm going to say about Mary is, wh what image kind of comes to mind when you think of Mary? The art, the uh, this incredible art she's inspired, sculpture and painting and everything. But what's the stance that Mary usually has if she's not the stance where she's reaching out or the angel's reaching to her? But how is she standing? When she say she's usually standing with her hands like this and her head down, she's usually merry, merry, meek, and mild. Yes. So that's the image I always thought of Mary until I read Denise Levertov's poem. And that was an eye opener because she said, I don't think there's a braver human being in the whole history of human beings than Mary, because Mary agreed to what she did. Her words are, Denise's words are, consent opened her utterly. 
consent opened Mary's heart utterly. So I give you that image to ponder in your heart. But let's move now to this story, this kind of, to me, amazing story. Uh, and we need still the message here some 50, 70 years ago, maybe uh, closer to 100 years ago. Um, and that is the innkeeper story. Uh, as uh, you all know, um, I'm sure, uh, that uh, he turned Mary and Joseph away when she was ready to give birth. Now, according to Casey, now Casey would not usually venture information unless someone asked him a question, right? And it, it wasn't often that he'd just pontificate, but he, he would, if somebody asked him a question, he'd answer. But this is different now. We have number... 1472, readings one through three. She was a 61-year-old female who had come to Mr. Casey to get a reading about her career and about her life, as any of us might do. Didn't come for a spiritual purpose at all, really. And all of a sudden, he starts telling her that she was a young girl named Serafa, and she was the innkeeper's daughter. They were all secret as scenes, you might say. They were as scenes, they knew the prophecies, they knew what was to happen, they knew that the Messiah was now finally coming to earth to help us all grow up as human beings, learn what it means to love. And uh, so he had to pretend that he was angry and send them away uh, so that the rabble rousers wouldn't know uh, that he was connected and, and wanting to harbor them, but he couldn't do it. So now I want to read you, it's kind of difficult language, but it's also some of the most lyrical, I think, in all of the readings about this uh, event. So Serafa here, asks, requests that she might be an aid in the preparation of those quarters to which the mother-to-be and the father might come that was revered by all. So the, so Serafa aided. She, that means, you know, an innkeeper's daughter, she did everything she could to clean up the inn, her, her own house, and when all was in readiness, when in the evening, just before the sun in all its glory of the Palestine hills gave forth almost into the voice of nature, proclaiming the heralding of a new hope, a new birth to the earth, and the glorifying of man's hope in God, the specter of his star in the evening sky brought awe and wonder to all that beheld. And then Serafa, being anxious, gazed with wondering awe at that unusual experience to all and wept with joy. And Gladys Davis Turner capitalized the whole word unusual and joy. That means he really emphasized it. And Serafa wept with joy of those expectancy of the glory that was coming that had, was going to surpass even the stories of her people in the days of old. So Serafa felt what may be very close akin to the experience of self in the present, that a new light, a vision, a new vision, a new experience was being born in every atom of her being. Then when it was known to Serafa, when she found out that the den, the cave, the stable had been occupied, the rush, oh, the desire to be off to see what that experience might be, held the very being of her being. And as soon as her duties were done, and she had cleared up the, every place and the home, as she 
as the space was very near, Serafa started. But she walked into the open. Upon that eve, the brightness of his star came nearer and nearer. And she heard, even as the shepherds, peace on earth, goodwill to all. There came again that awe, that feeling of a new creation, a new experience, as Serafa, among those, only with the closer attendance of the mother, hastened while all the rabble, all the jeers of a world were stopped, exclamation point. Don't see that very often either in the readings. As Serafa hastened to the quarters where the mother lay in all that awe of a new experience and the light as from his star filled the place, Serafa then first beheld the babe. That was the crowning experience until, until the plea that she too might hold that glorious child in her young arms. She was the second person in the whole world to hold the baby Jesus. And then, as this became a reality, and I know how gently one has to pass that little baby to one person, to another. As you probably all know, you can't let the neck go back. You have to hold the head up. You have to be so careful and tender. Here's this little 13-year-old girl having the courage to ask Mary. And she knew the prophecies, Seraphia did, who this infant baby was. Oh, if only the world might know that beauty, that joy, the glory, the experience of his life, Jesus' life, in their own hearts and minds and beings. Then the entity also saw the shepherds gather, and on the morrow the wise men came with their laden beasts or camels with all the praise for those who had kept the faith, for all those who were in need, who were alone, yet God was still with them. Now, that's a pretty amazing story. Uh, and I hope you enjoy thinking about that, just letting your mind have an imagination. Nobody knows the real truth anyway. We didn't have video back in those days. But what's interesting is the 61-year-old woman comes back to Casey and says, oh my gosh, this, that was me? Why am I back here 2,000 years later still working on myself, right? That's a question we would all be asking. Why is it taking me 2,000 years to get this right so I can go on, go on and leave the earth plane, come back in a tiny little baby body? And of course, uh, we're all like that now. So I'm going to ask you, how many of you have held an infant lately? I mean, a really small infant baby. Anybody? Oh, a few of you have. But most of you haven't. And I would say, that, of course, last year, I hadn't either for 33 years. Uh, uh, and so what I'm going to invite you to do is that there's a baby very close to you that I'd like you to hold. And that is you. You inside. Of all my years of being a pastor, 35 years of my years of being a spiritual counselor at the health spa, uh, I've come to believe that self-love is the main problem with the human race. It's not loving other people so much as it is loving and forgiving ourselves for all that we have screwed up and will screw up again. But hopefully we'll learn and do better at at uh, going forward. So what I'd like you to do, and I do this myself, especially if I'm having a hard time, uh, I, I hold my hands to my heart, so I'd like you to close your eyes, so if you feel comfortable, if not, just a soft gaze downward is good. Hold your heart, 
and repeat in your mind. You can say it under your breath if you want. But I want you to imagine that you're holding yourself, holding yourself as a little infant with all the promises and all the fears and all the dreams that you will have and have had. And, and hear the words. I am seen, I am known, I am loved, I am held. I am seen, I am known, I am loved, I am held. That is a very helpful tool to, to continue if we've already been realizing, oh, I need more self-love. I am. I've got a bully in me as big as any bully there ever was. <clears throat> and even that bully, especially that bully, needs to be held <clears throat> and loved. <clears throat> now, the... Uh, that we have an unusual party going on for Jesus here. It's not going to be like us where the, the parents go to the Comfort Inn and uh, they drive in a van and they have this fancy car seat and everything for Jesus. No, it's not like that. They're, they're, going, to be, uh, <clears throat> they're going to be coming into the place of this humble, humble abode. It's really an amazing story, not one of glory. Uh, essentially, although if you look at angels singing, that's pretty glorious. And uh, so music is important. Music that lifts your spirit, that's another really good tool to help keep you moving into your new consciousness and birthing, making a place for Jesus to be birthed in your heart. This season and throughout, throughout the year, and also, we have these gifts being given. Gold is a good one. We would take that, I'm sure. There, but it's offered frankincense and myrrh, two of the most expensive, especially frankincense, the most expensive essential oils in, or in the ancient days. And a gift like that would say these are healing gifts for Jesus, but they also are used to anoint the dead. Now that's pretty, pretty hard to think of. I would, I, I would hate thinking that when I'm holding Finnegan. Nobody wants to be thinking that, but Jesus could handle it. He had a special calling, dependent as he was on Mary at the time, and Seraphia, and. Then we have the gift that Harold Thurman says. He's a black theologian up at Boston University. He happened to teach uh, Martin Luther King Jr. of all people. All the webs, all the waves were interconnected. And I want to share with you this poem that he wrote very short. In the 1960s, they think, it's never been published. It's called The Work of Christmas. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to make music, in the heart. And now a celebration is nothing if it doesn't have some joy. So I'm going to close now with this wonderful piece by Annie Lamott. How many of you are familiar with her work? Any of you? She's a spiritual writer, but she's a humorist. That, that's a great combination, uh, I think, to have. And um, she mentions Presbyterians at the beginning, and I can do that because I've been attending a Presbyterian church. Uh, and I, um, so, so as, as we're giving gifts to the Christ child, I mean, 
It's not a diaper bag we're giving or a stroller. We are giving our lives, our hearts, our souls, our whole beings to that within us. I remember my father, when he'd lecture, saying, we're meant to be Pamela Christ, Susan Christ, Telly Christ. That's the goal. We are all and each children of God, not just Jesus. I, I don't buy that anymore, even as a pastor. Uh, we are all children of God. So she writes, I spoke at the Magnificent Theater in Kansas on Thursday to a big, rowdy crowd. Well, as rowdy as a crowd can be when it's rife with Presbyterians. The, the tricky thing was that half of the people were writerly types, i.e. tense and desperate, while half were faithy, i.e. slightly nuts. So what did we talk about? The whole holy enchilada, as someone once put it. I started the talk on how all of growth, healing, and progress begins with stopping. If you keep going where you're going, you are going to end up where you're headed. Is that a future that will bring you joy, satisfaction, laughter, or fulfillment? Or are you headed to a squandered life of multitasking, irritable marriage syndrome, suppressed creativity, and death by phone? You stop hitting the snooze button. You wake up. This is it. Not a dress rehearsal. Not practice for when you get it all together, because you never will. Name one person who's gotten it all together. So you start where your big Nemo butt is, as my grandson says. You ask yourself, how alive are you willing to be? How alive are you willing to be? Are you OK with current levels of presence, immediacy, laughter? Or do you long for a wilder, truer life, a goofier, duckier life, i.e. off the phone, off the internet? Well, you get to. Who knew? But you have to first stop. Stop living unconsciously with your lists, clipboards, anxiety, and spastic colon. What else? Well, maybe go. Go sit at your desk and write short assignments really badly. Go sit and practice meditation, even though on bad days it's like a squirrel with shingles. Maybe go outside. Maybe look up instead of down at your wobbly thighs and aching feet. Maybe look up at the wild canopy of stars overhead. Those goofy birds. If birdsong were the only proof there was a God, an intelligent love energy of some sort, it would be enough for me. Thrush, chickadees, loons, I'm in. Maybe go to church, temple, mosque, dance class, a room of recovery, a concert, where you can hook into something much bigger and lovelier than your own mind. That's heaven for me. So stop, go, wake up, spritz yourself with the plant mister of living water. I love that. Cry more, cleanse your soul, hydrate, baptize, grow the seeds at your feet, laugh more. It's the lifiest thing we can do. Laugh more. So pretty much the same old stuff I always say. I'm going to tell you, she closes. You are loved and chosen as you are. Annoying, motley you, me. We heal in community, so find one. We want you. As Frederick Buchner wrote, the grace of God means something like this. Here is your life. You might never have been, but you are 
because the party wouldn't be complete without you. Wow. And thanks. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.